Well, I'm Carol Bentel. Welcome to our kickoff lecture for our Inside the Box lecture series for fall 2021. Our topic this semester is about fitting inside the box in celebration of our new furniture design course. We will be focusing on the creative furniture designs of several artists and designers. We have a treat tonight. We have three very different furniture designers. That's what I've titled tonight. We have Kuros Magsudi, Ellen Pong, and Gustavo Barroso. And I am so delighted that they're here. Each will speak for about 15 minutes, and then you will get to ask this panel questions. And I know you will come up with great questions. So first up is Kuros Magsudi, and I'm gonna give um, a brief bio. Design has always surrounded Kuros Magsudi, who was born in the Frank Lloyd Wright suburbs of Chicago to parents who owned a boutique women's clothing store and Persian rug galleries. After earning his degree in sustainable architecture and urban design and joining an environmental nonprofit, he recently debuted his own furniture collection called Maymuni. Thank you. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Thank you so much. That draws directly from his Persian culture, but tinged with the playful postmodern uh, with playful postmodern motifs that encourage people to explore their hedonistic side. I also should say that Kuros just came back from the Milan Salone, and that is a Salone not to miss, filled with furniture. So welcome, Kuros. Thank you, appreciate the intro. Um, I will start off by sharing my screen. Can you guys see that? Yes. Great. My name is Kuros Maksudi. Thank you for the intro. Uh, my presentation is called Forcing You to Have Fun. And I want to start off by talking about my education background. So I studied kind of my own major of um, climate change, a little bit of architecture, but it was more lecture based, and a lot of urban design and Spanish. Um, so I did not have a formal design degree, so you guys are already 20 steps ahead of me. Um, but what I wanted to do with that degree was um, kind of find out how we can influence people's behavior through design uh, in a way that they live more sustainably. Um, so when I started my degree, I actually ended up going to Copenhagen for a little um, because Denmark is really a country that um, is achieving this. They have designed not only their cities, but their entire country um, to prioritize bikes. Um, and because of this, everyone's carbon footprint generally is much lower in Copenhagen. Um, so, you know, they have bridges just for bikes. They have, um, you know, all their public transport has full on carts that are just for bike parking. Um, so they, they were really able to design a city um, that almost forces you to behave in a more sustainable way. Um, and there is an argument to say, you know, like Danes love to bike, it's in their culture. But I promise you, if you take a Dane to Houston, Texas, they're not going to be biking on the highway. So Copenhagen really proved to me that with design, um, you can influence how someone behaves. Um, and with my first job, I took those principles. I worked at the, an environmental nonprofit where we would retrofit um, parking lots around New York City and turn it into public community parks. Um, and a lot of the things we had to consider was design. So we had to be very strategic where, with where we place our benches, our basketball courts, um, you know, look at the sun shading and what buildings are around to make sure that the play equipment's not in the sun at prime play hour. Um, so this position, you know, also really cemented that idea that um, design can influence how you behave and can be very preventative in a lot of ways. Um, another example of that is hostile architecture. Um, so for example, this bench is designed to be uncomfortable after a certain amount of time because the designer does not want you 
lingering in the area or sleeping on the bench. Um, and whether you like it, design is all around us and it's, um, you know, deciding how we behave, um, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, so I wanted to take that principle of using design um, to influence behavior and use it for good and use it for hedonism because I love to have fun and have dinner parties and go out. So I launched my first furniture line uh, in May and it's called Mehmuni, which in Farsi translates to gathering or party. Um, so all my furniture that uh, was a part of my first collection uh, really influences you to have fun and throw a party and gather people in your home. So my first piece is the Tarof table. It is a cocktail table, um, which is a fancy way of saying coffee table. Um, and the interesting thing about it is that each of the legs opens up into a different amenity. Um, the first one is a fruit bowl or uh, just a you know general bowl you can use for anything. Um, but the purpose that I promote is you know food and uh, fruit and things for your guests. Um, the second bowl is an ashtray, which oftentimes is essential at a party. And the third one, as you can see on the left, is an ice bucket. So all of these amenities, um, you know, facilitate and allow you to have your friends over, you know, open a bottle of champagne and gather. And that is something I love to do. Um, my next piece uh, were these two chairs. They're called the Beshin chairs, which in Farsi translates to take a seat. And um, this one was really influenced uh, by the way Iranians often, you know, sit uh, with their friends and family. We sometimes like to sit on our carpets, sit very close to the ground. Um, and if you look at these chairs in person, they have this re really interesting illusion just because of the thickness and the weight of the chair that they seem really low to the ground. Uh, but in reality, they meet standard chair height. Um, so it's providing that illusion um, that you're sitting really close to the ground, which is very common in Persian culture to sit on Persian carpets um, around a table. Um, so I wanted to allude to that. Um, and then my last piece is really just um, a fun piece that isn't necessarily tied to Persian culture. It's the phallic um, mirror and the name doodle is kind of slang for penis in Farsi but I guess this one is probably the least connected um, to Persian culture and having a mehmuni. And so when I made my first collection, I decided to do exactly what I love to do, have people over and throw a party. So I was showing at A83 Gallery in Soho. Uh, I invited a bunch of press. It was a New York City Design Week event. I invited a bunch of my friends and we had a party. We had an alcohol sponsor. It's a really good time and it was a great way to exemplify like how my furniture can be used. And before um, I continue, I want to um, talk a little bit about my furniture process uh, because when I was starting out doing furniture design, I was really intimidated by the process. I didn't know how it was done. Um, I, you know, was simply sketching and I would meet with furniture designers and I would just question like, how do I make this reality? And all of them said, it's really simple. You just do it. You talk to a fabricator and you do it. Um, so I'll show you guys my process. Um, my first pro my first step oftentimes is creating a mood board of furniture and, um, you know, details that I really like, um, and also colors and textures. So this uh, was a mood board for my chair. And then I do not have any concrete design skills. Um, I don't know how to use a lot of rendering programs. So I created this um, kind of blueprint of my table on Illustrator and I sent it out to a friend that does renderings. 
And we would work closely together for months making little edits um, according to what I wanted. Um, but I did not have, and I still don't really have the skills to make 3D models. So I personally outsource that. And it's good to know that that's an option. You don't need to be fluent in all these 3D rendering programs. And once you get your um, 3D rendering done, what I would do is I would send it out to a fabricator and they would turn that file into a reality. And it's really as simple as that. And it's important to note that your designs are gonna be evolving a lot throughout the design process. This was actually the original design for my coffee table, which is obviously extremely different um, than the final design that I showed earlier. Um, and like I said, uh, once you have that 3D rendering file, um, if you are not trying to actually make the pieces yourself, that is your gateway into a final product. So here are, are my chairs um, in the fabricator shop. They're 3D printed with corn-based plastic. Um, and he used the method of printing them really small and gluing them together um, and putting on um, the appropriate paint coats. Um, and another thing I want to mention is that even if you're not surrounded in the design community, um, you know, there's still a lot of resources and connections that are valuable. My background, um, not my professional, but more of my friends are all in fashion. They run a lot of fashion brands. And through that, I was able to build the resources and connect connections necessary to do a lot of cool things. Uh, one thing I did recently, um, was this editorial shoot with my furniture. And it really was only possible. These are the friends I had already in the industry. So my the stylist, the makeup artist, the producer, the hair artist, the photographer were all my friends that traditionally work in the fashion world. Um, so just because you, know, you might come across someone who doesn't work in furniture, they can still you know, be a value in your life. Um, and in your career later down the road. So I encourage you to work with your friends that might not traditionally be familiar with furniture. And another piece of advice that I kind of had to deal with myself, uh, my parents are from Iran and they immigrated here. And it was a tricky situation because they did not want me to pursue anything creative or furniture wise. Um, and I understood it because they came here, they escaped a theocratic government and they came here for me to have a better life. And they wanted me to do computer science or something you know, more secure financially. And I am really happy I didn't listen to them because I was you know, two clicks away from changing my major to computer science. And I'm so glad I didn't. So if you ever have those either external or internal pressures to abandon design or art, I encourage you not to. And I understand it's a little tricky, especially with immigrant parents, um, you know, the, the weight you have on your shoulders to pursue something more traditional. Um, but I'm very glad I didn't. Um, and lastly, um, internships. If you guys are looking to intern, I would love to have you. I am someone who does not believe in free labor and I'm not in a position where I can pay right now, but I'm happy to take your information. Um, and when I come to a point where I can hire an intern, I would love to. And um, my friend's design studio, Quick Plug, um, is hiring paid interns if you would like to work with them. They do really cool projects with Telfar and other fashion brands. Um, so if you're looking for an internship, feel feel, feel free to email me um, and I'd be happy to connect you. And that is it. Thank you so much. I want your table. I didn't know <laughs> that you could eat from it. That yeah. is terrific. And, yeah. and regarding internships, I mentioned to Kouros that you all have three days to sign up for um, <laughs> the internship for credit. So I don't know if there's enough time. But anyway, thank you so much. And I have so many thoughts and questions, but we're going to save everything until we're 
uh, we go through all three of us. But and you also um, could you just quickly put up your phone with Gaetano Pesce? Um, oh yes. When Kuros was at, uh, he left Milan, but it turns out that Gaetano Pesce, the designer who is the namesake for our uh, soft tech, low tech lab, is speaking today in yeah. Milan. No, this is think, Milan 94. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I think this is in the Upper East Side, I'm pretty sure. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. He's right around yeah. the corner. Right. And there's a show there for a while, so. I encourage you guys to go. Okay, we'll look that up. Great. Yeah. All right, now we're uh, moving on to Ellen Pong, who, who's titled her talk, My First Talk, but I bet it's not, and I bet it's not your last. So a little bit about Ellen. Ellen is a Brooklyn-based artist ceramicist who graduated from UC Berkeley. She once noted that, I get that humor is culturally and temporally specific. But I think that it can be also universal in many ways and profound in its ability to create a sense of shared humanity. I want the things I make to be part of people's lives. So Ellen. So I don't know if Ellen is muted or not. There you are. Okay, here I am. Um, thank you so much, Carol, for inviting me to speak today. Um, thank you for that great intro too. Um, I've been like really looking forward to this talk, but I've also been kind of like freaking out about it a little bit. Um, it's the first talk I've ever given, um, as I'm sure you all know by now. Um, and I just like kind of feel like a fraud in so many ways, um, partially because, um, wait, this is what my Zoom setup looks like right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of like where my head's at. Um, but I am very excited to be here and to talk to you guys, um, to talk about myself for 15 minutes. Um, I always introduce myself as a ceramicist, partially because like furniture designer just like seems like such a stretch to me. Like basically I'm just like too lazy to like learn Rhino. So I just like make everything by hand and out of clay. Um, but as I was like preparing for this talk, I kind of came to the conclusion that like I'm actually not all that like interested in ceramics or like even furniture really like as an end goal they're most they're both just kind of like means for me to like grasp at something else which is something that I kind of like explore um during this talk and I'm not really sure if I like ever come to a solid conclusion about like what that is but hopefully it will still be very entertaining for you all. Um, so when thinking about how I first became interested in furniture, I think it mostly started from just like an interest in like the home space in general, which is definitely something that I picked up from my parents. Um, my parents used to take me to this thing every year called Street of Dreams which is like this event in Seattle where I'm from, um, where like every year they build an entire neighborhood from scratch. And it's like a single street or like cul-de-sac of just like all these huge, ridiculous luxury homes. Um, and then like, you can like buy tickets and tour them in kind of like a weird block party open house type thing. Um, this is a photo from 2008 when I think all but one of the Street of Dreams houses was burned down by eco-terrorists. Um, but people also say that that is like a cover-up story for insurance fraud. So very exciting stuff happening on the Street of Dreams. Um, that was the last year that they held the event. Um, but yeah, so like all of these houses were just furnished like these like pumpkin spice latte villain layers basically like the, the energy from this photo, but like embodied in a neighborhood. 
So like all the houses had like movie theaters and like swimming pools, um, bars, basketball courts. Like it was basically like being inside of MTV cribs kind of. Um, and it was like super fun, but also I also kind of hated it because I was just like really young and we'd have to like walk around for like hours and hours. Um, but I think that like having this experience uh, definitely like mutated my little brain back then because it just like, it like signaled to me that homes are this like, this space of like ultimate aspiration and like world building. Um, and that like your house is just kind of like this free for all space where like you can experiment and like project your most irrational impulses uh basically the conclusion is just that like you can make your house like as ugly as you want to and like no one can tell you not to um and like this is how that played out in my bedroom when I was younger um I actually had a really hard time finding photos which is kind of a bummer but um this is a photo from like 2013 or 14 um you can kind of see in the back I had like this crazy paint job uh, where there was like a diagonal line down the middle of the room and like one half of the room was teal and the other side was yellow. Um, and I like designed this when I was 13 years old. Like I told my mom that like my room had to look like this where I would like die or something. Um, I actually wanted there to be like a, a white lightning bolt down the middle, like splitting the two sides. But like this is what we compromised on um but yeah I think I was just like really influenced by shows like extreme home makeover um and I like wanted my room to be like this perfect masterpiece that like perfectly reflected um all the nuances of my personality or something um and I think it's really interesting looking back actually because like this was like pre-social media for me in 2008 um, I think I got a MySpace like around the same time, but like a little bit later. Um, and like before kids had like a profile to curate on the internet, um, bedrooms were essentially like the space where that kind of self-expression could like manifest holistically. Um, that and also like school lockers, but maybe that was only in like TV shows or something. Cause like that was never a thing at my school. Um, but yeah, I remember like feeling very invested in like my bedroom as this space of like self-expression um, that like actually wasn't really intended to be like seen by other people, which I'm sure is like different now with social media, just because like kids nowadays are like so good at curating their lives to like exist online. Um, but yeah, I was like definitely interested in furniture and interior design at like a young age because I felt like like these were just like the objects uh, or just like like these objects were like the materials with which I could like shape my own little corner of reality. Um, and I'm like really grateful that my parents went along with it and like encouraged me even though my room like looked like complete shit. Um, they were like, yeah, like, it looks good. <laughs> um, but both my parents have always been like, for the most part, like super supportive and like encouraging of all my dumb little like creative interests and stuff. Um, but it's funny because like ceramics was actually like the one thing that they were like really skeptical about for some reason. Um, this is one of the first ceramic pieces I ever made. Um, it's a self-portrait of myself from a second grade art class. Um, apparently, I thought I was like literally yellow and I had like blue eyes and dreads. <laughs> um, but it wasn't until like senior year of high school that I like actually really took an interest in ceramics. Um, I like took this class at school and like learned how to wheel throw and stuff and I like got super into it and like the summer before I started college I just like had nothing to do uh and I asked my parents if I could like set up a little ceramic studio in the garage and they were like no bitch like go get a job <laughs> so I like got a job instead but like I think that they were like secretly 
really afraid that I would like get really into ceramics um, and that I would like turn into one of those like crunchy Seattle hippie ladies like selling like galaxy mugs and like bongs at hemp fest or something um which is funny because like I'm totally like a dumb crunchy ceramicist making galaxy mugs and bongs <laughs> but yeah so I like did ceramics on the side um throughout college back then I was just like throwing on the wheel and stuff um just for fun and then like when I moved to New York after school I started hand building for the first time and I had this kind of like galaxy brain moment where I was like, oh, like I don't have to keep making like shitty little cups and bowls and stuff. Like I can make infinite other shitty things too. So I just like started building bigger and bigger um, until eventually like my pieces were like big enough to sit on. So that's kind of where I'm at now. Um, this is like the first big piece that I ever att attempted to make. It was gonna be like uh, the base for a table and it just like got like super fucked up in the kiln. Like, I don't even know what happened, but I ended up just like smashing it in a dumpster. Um, like working with clay can just like be really tricky sometimes. Um, it's like really different from working with other materials just because like um I don't know like clay is like it has like a very particular temperament like it kind of has a mind of its own um and there's like a lot of opportunities in the process for things to go wrong but maybe I also just feel that way because I'm like I like didn't go to school for this shit and like I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time um This is like basically how I feel 99% of the time when I like make stuff. Uh, ceramics is great because it like keeps you very humble. Um, there's like an element of unexpectedness in the process, which I actually like very much. Um, Cause it just kind of like keeps you on your toes all the time. Uh, sometimes I like to like think of ceramics as like almost like a sport because like a lot of the times you lose, but also sometimes you win. Um, so here's a little like highlight reel of some of the things that I've made. Um, this is a chair that I designed. I like built it sideways. So I started with like a slab cut out of like the profile of the chair. And then I like coil built it upwards and then like closed the other end with like another slab. So the inside is like hollow, um, which is like necessary when you fire things in the kiln. Um, this is what it looks like right side up. Um, and this is like before it's bisque fired. So like you fire ceramics twice, there's like a bisque fire and then a glaze fire. And between the two firings is when you glaze stuff. Oh, I like sent these photos to my grandma and this is how she responded. She was like, cute <laughs> that was funny um this is what the chair looks like when it comes out of the bisque fire and then this is what it looks like after i have glazed it but like before it's been fired and then this is the final form um okay so this is like a shitty little sketch of like a table concept that I had. It was like a table and a lamp. Um, this is actually one of the biggest pieces I've ever made. Um, it was like too big to fit in the kiln as like one piece. So I like cut it into four different pieces. And then after it was fired, I like epoxied it all together. Um, and then I painted it. And then this is what it looks like assembled with like the light bulb in there. Um, okay, this was like just a photo that I came across somewhere on the internet. And it like really caught my eye because I was like, whoa, this looks like so weird and disgusting. <laughs> 
it was just like seared into my mind. Um, and I like ultimately decided to make a tissue box cover inspired by it. Um, this is like, while well, it's being built. This is after I've glazed it. And then this is after the final firing, what it looks like. Um, and these are just some pieces that I've been like working on more recently. Again, like I really don't know what I'm doing and I don't have a plan. I think it can be like overwhelming sometimes to like think too long-term. So I kind of just like take it piece by piece. Like whenever I get kind of like anxious about like where this is all going or whatever, like I'm just like, okay, Ellen, like just make like one more piece like that's like all you have to do like just like one more and like after I like trick myself into doing that over and over again um I like end up with the studio full of stuff which is cool um and usually starting a piece begins with like just kind of seeing something interesting on the street or like in a movie or like on Instagram or something um These are just like a bunch of random reference photos that I found in like my phone library. Um, it can be like a really small detail that like catches my eye, like the way that like two things fit together or like the shape of a handle or something. Um, I'm kind of interested in like really small units of architecture that like make up larger forms, kind of like the way that like letters make up words, if that makes sense. Um, other times I'm like more interested in, in like a concept or like an idea that I find like dumb or like interesting or something. Um, but ultimately I've learned that just kind of like great inspiration comes from just being like observant and like learning how to see the world um, more like this, where you just like see things as forms devoid, devoid of context. Uh, and then like in that vacuum of meaning, um, there's like all these new possibilities. And in a lot of ways, I think of it as being kind of like um, Chinglish because like, I like this idea of like Chinglish as a state of mind because ultimately it's about like appropriating a pre-existing reality and then like reconfiguring it in this aesthetic way to produce something like totally weird and unex unexpected. Um, and yeah, just like going back to what I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, um, for me, like it's ultimately not just about like ceramics or material or like furniture necessarily. Like, I think I'm more so just interested in like how the objects that we surround ourselves with are like the materials that we use to make up our reality. And like if spaces and objects are things to be visually read in the sense that they like communicate intention or like function or taste or something. Um, as someone who makes objects, I'm interested in like playing the role of an unreliable narrator. So that's all to say that you should take everything I've said here with a grain of salt because um, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but thank you very much for letting me hold you all hostage. <laughs> Ellen, you brought up so many ideas from going from using clay that's normally a smaller, something small to something that is really big. Yeah. And yet maybe something that's big that you don't really sit on. Um, in in an earlier prompt to all these students, I mentioned that sometimes people buy chairs and they never even sit on them. So totally. I think you've given us a lot of data, a lot of interesting material to talk about. All right, so we're gonna go on. Thank you, Ellen. We're gonna go on to Gustavo, Gustavo Barroso. And if I can give a short bio here. Gustavo emigrated from Brazil to the United States with his parents and brother in 1999. In 2019, he graduated from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design with a BFA in industrial design. Days before graduation, Gustavo opened his first solo exhibition in New York City. 
so welcome. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> um, okay, let me share my screen here. <clears throat> share sound, boom. Okay, can you guys see my screen and everything? Yes. Awesome. Looks great. Yeah, sweet. So like you said, Carol, my name is Gustavo Barroso. Um, I'm a Brazilian immigrant. I'm mainly interested in, although I studied industrial design, I'm mainly interested in sculpture and exploring furniture as a medium. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, I've worked with people and brands like Kid Super, Heron Preston. Um, I've worked with musicians like Yeek, uh, Reese LaFlair, uh, Ray Khalil. Um, but today I'm going to focus mainly, I'm pretty much going to be sharing only my furniture practice and specifically uh, the chairs that I've made. Um, and people always ask me, why chairs? <laughs> they're like, why are you obsessed with chairs? Like, I'll be at a party and they'll be like, that's Gustavo, the chair guy. <laughs> and I'm like, it's actually kind of good for my branding. Um, but I think what really attracts me to chairs, and I think this is important to, to a lot of you too, from my understanding, uh, most of you are studying interior design. Um, the thing is chairs have a personality. Chairs are like uh, people, you know, chairs symbolize a time, they symbolize culture, um, they symbolize a person's status, they symbolize a person's values. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when you're thinking about an interior space, you're basing your decisions on those chairs based on those things, you know, the culture, the status, the values that the people that are coming into those space have. Um, and then particularly the part that I'm most interested in is the personality that these chairs have. Um, so kind of like how they say people, people buy dogs that kind of look like them or, or kind of, you know, remind them of like how their own personalities or how they aspire to be. I think chairs also carry like a weird energy, you know, carry, or their own energy into a room. Um, so this painting that I have up, on the slide is a, a painting that Van Gogh did for, um, it's a portrait that he did of his friend that had passed. And uh, Van Gogh would paint a lot of chairs and you know he'd call them portraits and people would be like, how is it a portrait? There's nobody in it. And he would say, well, it's not about, it's not about the person, it's about the absence of a person. Which is funny because whenever we see pictures of chairs, there's never people in them, right? It's about how they look and how we imagine them without anybody. Um, so when I'm designing and making chairs, uh, I'm thinking, you know, about them as timestamps in my life and also about how other people can relate to them, uh, from an, an emotional sense, you know, how it can be a social conduit. Um, and I'm also interested in chairs because it allows, it allows me to say several things at once. Um, obviously it can provide somebody a place to rest, but it can also offer conversations, ideas, and societal criticism. Um, so something that I'm always thinking about is emotion as function, right? So whenever I show people my work, they always ask, okay, but is it functional? And what I, although it is, although it is functional, I always ask back, you know, like, what is the function of music and sports and movies? Um, you know, it's the function of it isn't always necessarily like a physical thing. It's this societal glue that exists. It's this, it's this place for conversation that can exist between people besides just a, a, a literal place that you can sit, you know, because the, the obvious function of furniture is that it, you should be able to rest on it and hopefully it's comfortable, right? And then that leads to the next question, which is what is comfort? Uh, you know, comfort implies so many variables. Like you can be sitting in an Eames chair, but if your house is on fire, <laughs> you're not gonna be very comfortable, right? And also if your chair is comfortable physically, but you hate the way it looks, are you really comfortable looking at it every day? Right. Um, so the, the, the second question of, of that, you know, how does it look and how, 
uh, emotionally, how can a chair physically, what, what can it say besides just actually providing a place to sit is what I'm interested in exploring the most. So what I call the sauce <laughs> is essentially like how the sauce is my, what, like what makes the things that I design mine, right? So I'm always fusing popular imagery um, with sculptural furniture. And to me that equals conversation and conversation is cultural relevance, right? If you can get people talking about what you're making, you can um, put yourself in conversations that are much about much more than just chairs, right? Like Kuros was saying earlier, working with people, like if you're an interior designer, you wanna be interior, you wanna be doing interior design with fashion brands, with, music, with musicians, with a bunch of other um, people that are also contributing to creative culture besides people specifically in your field, right? And I'm always trying to see like, where do I fit in? Although I make chairs, like I'm not trying to necessarily talk to other chair designers. I'm trying to talk to culture in general. Um, so this is one of the first projects that I made. Um, it's called Found Anywhere. It's inspired by graffiti. And the idea behind this was I was in school, I had no money to actually produce like actual furniture, furniture, furniture. And I say furniture three times like that because you know what I mean? Like upholstered furniture that like people are gonna spend money on. Um, so let me just play the video. So yeah, this is a piece, um, it's from my ongoing series called Found Anywhere. Um, I'll just play that again while I talk. And the, the idea behind the series, you know, it's inspired by street art and graffiti is this idea that anywhere in the world that I go, I can find scraps and trash on the street and I can assemble it into a piece of furniture that then lives on as a portrait of its environment, right? So. Um, with this piece specifically, I, I chose to make a bench because, you know, I, I live in New York City and New York City is filled with benches. And I thought it'd be ironic to take a barricade and a cone, which are these things that are meant to keep people away, you know, keep people back. I thought it'd be ironic to make it a bench, which is, you know, it's meant for more than one person to sit on. And this piece, um, I made it as street art. So... After I made it, I just left it in the street. And one of my friends, uh, actually the owner of Kid Super was like, yo, uh, actually I want that. So for him, convenient enough, it was, conveniently enough, it was right in front of his store. So he just came and grabbed it and kept it. <laughs> um, but the whole idea of these is to think of furniture not as just something that somebody buys and puts in their house, but as something that can be an installation out in the street. Um, from there, yeah, so these are close up pictures of it. I just cut a hole on one side and a uh, mortise and tenon on the other. So after I graduated college, I was kind of stuck in a position where I was designing all of these things and I couldn't really make much. Luckily, I had access to a 3D printer, so I just started designing and, and printing stuff. So one night when I was looking for inspiration, um, I stumbled upon this Wendell Castle chair, who's like my, he's my goat essentially, um, because Wendell, Wendell Castle was somebody who approached furniture as sculpture, right? So George Nakashima pretty much like invented the, the live edge slab furniture movement that we see all throughout our culture right now. And it's actually sad to me that George Nakashima pretty much hated Wendell Castle's work because he thought that Wendell Castle wasted uh, wood, right? Because this is all laminated wood. And um, George Nakashima was pretty much only interested in just using slab wood and using it, like doing it like the minimal amount of work to it and just like letting the wood talk for itself, right? And Wendell Castle was the opposite. He was like, well, George Nakashima would never criticize me. Like George Nakashima would never criticize a sculptor the same way that he did him, 
right? Like the only reason why he was criticizing him that way was because furniture is often seen as this thing that should just be functional, right? Um, a lot of the most famous furniture makers, Eames, Brewer, um, Harry Bertoia, all of these people, they were famous because they were using emerging technologies at the time to make furniture as innovative as they could, right? And although that is important, and there's a lot of people that are exploring that today with generative design and 3D printing, and I do incorporate that in some of my work as well, to me, I'm much more interested in kind of exploring um, the side of furniture design that Wendell, Ka that Wendell Castle talks about, which is creating pieces that tell a story, right? So I, when I saw this piece on the left here, I just immediately saw like a uh, Mickey Mouse, like legs. <laughs> and the first, when I immigrated to the United States, the very first thing I did was went to Disney World, which is a privilege within itself. Um, but that's how we even got here in the first place. So uh, this is a 3D printed prototype that I made. Um, I haven't been able to fabricate this yet just because it's a little bit expensive. Um, but yeah, seeing, seeing this design that he did and just immediately being like, oh, I can make that my own. And the fact that he already passed, I'm stealing from him, but I feel good about it. <laughs> I think he'd be proud. Um, so this is just a little bit of an insight into my process. So I'm a little bit of a sad boy. Uh, so I decided to make the sad boy chair. Um, quarantine sucked for me. So this is, oops, this is a piece that I sculpted in VR. Um, so using the Oculus Quest uh, and Gravity Sketch, I sculpted this piece in VR. And then I also sculpted for, this is something I have not produced yet either, but for the fabricator, I went in and kind of, uh, once I am ready to fabricate it, I went in and sculpted kind of how it would actually be made. So I envision it being pipe steel um, with webbing and then surrounded in foam and upholstered. Um, but while this was all happening and knowing that I don't have the money to physically produce it yet, I started learning about NFTs and I realized that for the first time ever, um, you know, we can monetize digital, digital creations without uh, like losing right to the actual design. So this was one of the first, I think this was the second or third thing I minted on the blockchain. Um, let me know if you guys are able to hear this. Yeah. So yeah, um, I minted that, you know, as an NFT, I sold it for Ethereum, which was really interesting to me because for a long time, we've been hearing about all this crypto stuff and I'm not interested in looking at charts. I'm not interested in buying Bitcoin. I'm not interested in trading coins or any of that stuff, but learning about NFTs and realizing that I can participate in this new economy um, by being a creative was something that was really interesting to me. So I started exploring it a little bit more. Um, this was something that I minted for Nike Air Max Day. It's unofficial. Um, I would love if Nike sued me, you know, maybe it would help me get a little bit of attention. <laughs> um, I have no money to give them. So <laughs> um, this was something that I made just to celebrate Nike Air Max Day this year. Um, and, you know, this was, I forget, in 1978, the first inflatable chair was made. I forget the name of the designers. Um, but then, you know, the Air Max has a bubble. So I thought it'd be funny to just fuse the two. Um, this was another piece that I made, Better Off Alone. I sculpted, so I sculpted all three of these pieces in VR. And then 
uh, did a digital rendering of them. And the nice thing about doing things in VR or doing CAD models of anything is that, you know, once you've done that, you have a, a file with, with dimensions that is not only 3D printable, but also something that you can hand off to a fabricator and something that is, is tangible that they can then make for you. Um, so this, after I made those three pieces, I was kind of like tired of just being stuck in the digital world. And I had a, I had a, an art studio that I rented out, but it was empty. I had no tools. I didn't have, I didn't have any saws. I literally had like nothing. I had just graduated college. Um, so I just challenged myself to just make something like, it didn't matter what I was going to make. I just needed to be like making something and make something actually in the physical world. So I went and bought this chair for $3 um, at Savers. And then I started to build up on it with cardboard and paper mache. So that was, this is actually after I already did the paper mache on it. Um, and then after that, I covered it in uh, another material and I sanded it down. And then I finished it in, um, epoxy and for anybody that remembers nickelodeon and the crazy slime stuff they used to do uh, this is called the green slime chair um, and then after i made this chair i found myself in another weird tricky position for somebody who's like early in their career which is i was you know i was making this piece on weekends and nights and i spent three months doing it so when it comes to selling it i'm like damn, I don't, I don't personally know that many people. I came up with a price, which was 2,500 at the time. And I was like, I don't know that many people who spend $2,500 on a chair. So I just started, you know, posting it on Instagram, sending it to a bunch of different people and trying to find other ways that I could get people involved to like supporting this project without needing to spend $2,500 on it. So oh, I'm going to be tiny, aren't I? All right, anyways, so I made these shirts with the front of the chair on the front and the back on the back. The goal was to make money from it. Um, well, I did a pre-order and I didn't make any money from it because I sold them before I knew how much they actually cost to make. So <laughs> if you're gonna pre-order something, figure out how much it's gonna cost to make before you do it. <laughs> um, so that didn't work very well. Um, the next idea was after I had the chair made, I took it to a 3D scanner and I started, I 3D printed a little version of it. So now I'm trying to figure out, you know, how can I make, so now that this, a collector has bought this chair and one person gets to kind of enjoy this chair on, in their home, like how can I make this chair more than just this one piece that some that one person who happens to have money gets to enjoy right and that's a whole other discussion within itself um but let's see yeah so i made the point of this chair and really just something that i want to get across is you know when you're when you're in school or when you're finishing school, when you step out of school, you start to kind of realize that when you're in school, you're living in a little bit of a bubble. And once you get out into the real world, it's like, you don't have a shop. You don't have, you don't have a way to make all of these things that you want to make. And there's the most important thing is making sure you're not you don't find yourself being a not enough person. You know, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources because there's never enough of that, right? Um, as soon as you, as soon as you accomplish one thing, you want to do something bigger regardless, right? So this chair was a way for me to prove to myself that literally with a hot glue gun and a knife, I could sculpt something out of cardboard around this frame and turn it into something that was actually like a vision of my own. Um, and then this is a chair that I'm currently working on right now. It's gotten a lot of hate on the internet, which means it's working. 
Um, I took a perfectly functional chair <laughs> that I found uh, being thrown away and I turned it on its side and I'm making another chair on it. <laughs> so yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer.